there is new information raising questions about whether there was a cover-up by the State Department to deflect criticism that it had ignored requests for more security for its people in Libya. Republican Congressman Darrell Issa heads the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. One of the committees that's been investigating this week, they will hear testimony from Greg Hicks, a 22-year Foreign Service diplomat who was the number two U.S. official in Libya who was talking to Washington during and after the attack. Chairman Issa is here today to reveal some of the startling excerpts from Greg Hicks's interview with his investigators. Surprisingly, this will be the first time anyone has heard publicly from Hicks. And as you will see, his story is totally at variance with what some American officials were saying in public on this broadcast five days after the attack. The administration claimed the attack grew out of a spontaneous demonstration provoked by protests in Egypt. Greg Hicks told investigators that was simply not true. Part of what he said, Hicks, I thought it was a terrorist attack from the get-go. I think everybody in the mission thought it was a terrorist attack from the beginning. Question. Did you ever have any indication that there was a protest, a popular protest, outside the mission in Benghazi? Greg Hicks, no question. And if there was such a protest, would that have been reported? Hicks, absolutely. For there to have been a demonstration on Chris Stevens' front door and him not to have reported it is unbelievable. So... Mr. Issa, why would the administration put out a storyline that was so different from what U.S. officials in Libya knew immediately? Well, that's the great question. We can't find a classified reason for it. We can't find a diplomatic reason for it. Understand that Gregory Hicks, who became the charge, became the acting ambassador, witnessed our relationship with Libya on this show go the wrong way. Because on this show... Susan Rice says it was a protest, while the president, the elected president, saying, no, it's a terrorist attack. You can't insult a foreign leader in a greater way than, was, than happened literally here just those few days later. But do you think they were trying to cover up the fact that the State Department had turned down requests for more security that had been coming in from the diplomats on the ground there? Is that what this is about? Well, perhaps in part, but it does seem like it's bigger than that. Uh, there was this normalization, uh, sort of a, a mentality where you had to pretend like things were safe, the war on terror was over, and that may have gone uh, in a great way to getting people to say, well, we can't call this a terrorist attack because then, then the, the war on terror is back alive. Well, Bob, the war on terror is very much alive, whether it's Chechen nationals that come here, or it's what's going on in Syria, it's Al-Qaeda around the world, and that's the reality that hopefully State Department people will feel at least they are being properly protected after this attack. The uh, Weekly Standard reported that the first reports that went out from the CIA, including the assertion from the U.S. government, that they knew there were Islamic extremists with ties to Al-Qaeda, participating in this attack. But after seeing the first version of the talking points, the Weekly Standard says a ranking official at the State Department who they've identified as Victoria Newland, who is the spokesman for the department, sent a message they were worried that members of Congress would use the talking points to criticize the State Department for not paying attention to agency warnings about needing more security. And it was after that that these different versions of the talking points came out. Can you confirm that? Well, I think your next witness can, can talk to many of the things that have been kept away from us, these talking points and how they changed. But we know one thing. The talking points were right, and then the talking points were wrong. The CIA knew it was a terrorist attack. The Deputy Chief of Mission, Gregory Hicks, knew it was a terrorist attack. The ambassador, before he died, one of the last words he ever said is, we're under attack. Well, let me just go back to this, uh, these, these uh, questions that you asked of uh, Greg Hicks. Five days after the attack, the UN ambassador, Susan Rice, appeared on all five Sunday talk shows, including this one. But on this broadcast, her interview was preceded by our interview with the new president of Libya, Mohammed el Magarif. I'm going to run a clip now of what he told us and what she said in response 
which totally contradicted him. Was this a long planned uh, attack, uh, as far as you know, or what, what do you know about that? The way these uh, perpetrators acted and moved, uh, I think we, and uh, they're choosing the specific date for this uh, so called demonstration. I think we have no, this leaves us with no doubt that this has pre-planned, determined, predetermined. What our assessment is as of the present is in fact what it began spontaneously in Benghazi uh, as a reaction to what had transpired some hours earlier in Cairo. You do not agree with him that this was something that had been plotted out we do several not, months we ago? We do not have information at present that leads us to conclude that this was premeditated or preplanned. Now, here is what Mr. Hicks said about Secretary Rice's answer that morning. He said, the net impact of what has transpired is the spokesperson of the most powerful country in the world has basically said that the president of Libya is either a liar or doesn't know what he's talking about. The impact of that is immeasurable. Magarif has just lost face in front of not only his own people, but the world. My jaw hit the floor as I watched this. I've never been as embarrassed in my life in my career is on that day. I never reported a demonstration. I reported an attack on the consulate. Chris's last report, if you want to say his final report is, Greg, we are under attack. It is jaw-dropping that to me how that came to be. Mr. Hicks went on to tell your investigators that no one from the State Department contacted him before Ambassador Rice's appearance. He said, I was personally known to one of Ambassador Rice's staff members. I could have been called. And you know, the phone call could have been, hey, Greg, Ambassador Rice is going to say blah, blah, blah. I could have said, no, that's not the right thing. The phone call was never made. Again, uh, what was going on here? Well, clearly there was a political decision to say something different than what was reasonable to say. And, and I think, Bob, one of the, the, the tragedies of this is it took three weeks to get our FBI in. Well, when you tell the president of Libya, uh, who, by the way, went to Benghazi at personal risk, did that broadcast from Benghazi as a courageous act, if you tell him he's wrong, that it's not terrorism, what a surprise that you have a hard time getting FBI to the crime scene. If anything, we may have compromised our ability to know what really happened there as far as catching the culprits because more weeks went by.